Relative to our own world, the universe of Fallout has made some remarkable advancements in the field of robotics. From the helpful robotic nannies that once cared for children, to the colossal mining machines that reshaped the wasteland, mechanical creations have played a pivotal role in both pre- and post-war America. As technology progressed and demand for more impressive machines grew, some of these robots expanded in size, becoming towering behemoths that left a lasting impact on the wasteland. These are the largest robots the wasteland has witnessed. The Sentrybot In a world where mutant freaks, deadly creatures, and hostile factions lurk at every turn, one robotic sentinel remains as one of the deadliest wasteland encounters. The Sentrybot Towering in size and armed to the teeth, the Sentrybot represents the pinnacle of pre-war military technology. The Sentrybot is a hulking marvel of engineering, designed for both defensive and offensive purposes. Towering over all humans and weighing likely several tons, these mechanical mechs strike fear into the hearts of any who dare to challenge them. Their intimidating presence alone is often enough to dissuade potential aggressors. But if one does dare to take on a Sentrybot, they'll be met with a large arsenal of weapons capable of annihilating anything in its path. Missile launchers, miniguns, gatling lasers, and cluster grenade launchers stand at the ready and are able to make short work of most threats. As seen at the Cabot House, a single sentry bot is often enough to keep an asset protected. Now while their primary function is combat, sentry bots can also serve as mobile platforms for scouting and security. Despite appearing clunky and slow, the Sentrybot is quite mobile, capable of moving at great speeds and over many rough terrains. Equipped with advanced sensor arrays and targeting systems, as indicated in-game by their loot and high perception, they can detect enemies from great distances and engage them with precision accuracy. Combine this with their robust armor plating, and it makes them challenging adversaries to encounter, let alone defeat. Oftentimes encounters with Sentrybots, at least in my experience, is met with nothing but dread. I find them on par with the Mirelurk Queen and Behemoths. Sometimes the Sentrybot is worse. I'd honestly rather fight a Deathclaw than a Sentrybot. It's quite easy to be simply outgunned and overwhelmed by these robotic angels of death. But how did they come to be? Well, as one might expect, the Sentrybot was designed by Robco Industries and the US Army with a singular goal in mind. Provide security, through overwhelming firepower. Nothing says don't trespass like 6,000 rounds per minute of hot lead. By 2063, the Sentrybot was a standard part of the military's augmented fighting force. Sentrybots would see limited use in the Anchorage conflict during the Sino-American War. However, despite their many capabilities, these mighty mechs were unable to prevent a global nuclear exchange from decimating the world. The aftermath of the Great War would bring about an unexpected change in the role of the Sentrybots. With society in ruins and civilization reduced to scattered factions, these formidable war machines fell into the hands of various groups, ranging from military remnants to rogue divisions, and even enterprising individuals. Some factions reprogrammed these Sentrybots for their own purposes, using them as guardians, enforcers, or even as a display of power and dominance. In the Fallout games, Sentrybots can be found in a variety of locations, secret laboratories, military installments, and even just randomly across the main protagonist's adventure. In most cases, happening upon a Sentrybot is an unwelcome surprise. What was once a military tool of destruction directed at enemies of the state has continued its warpath post-war. A unique and deadly combination of firepower, size, durability, and speed makes the Sentrybot a haunting reminder of the Fallout Universe's technological capabilities. The Mother Load In the vast and treacherous Appalachian wasteland of Fallout 76, among the remnants of a world ravaged by nuclear devastation, one enigmatic entity looms large, the Mother Load. A colossal mining robot of immense proportions, the Motherlode stands as a testament to both the industrious spirit of pre-war America and acts as a key to unlock the mysteries that persist in the post-apocalyptic landscape. 
The origins of the motherlode trace back to pre-war. Daniel Hornwright, CEO of Hornwright Industrial, one of two major mining families in the region, began secretly designing the autonomous mining robot as a pet project. The motherlode was meant to revolutionize the mining industry by automating the extraction process of valuable resources without any human involvement. Following the loss of his wife Evelyn, more of Daniel's focus and time would be put into the motherlode, anything to distract him from his loss. More and more of Hornwright Industrial's resources, time, and manpower were going towards Project Motherlode. This got to the point where Hornwright's other initiatives, like developing air purifier sites, started to get delayed. Eventually, rumors of a mining monolith began circulating around the region. An investigative journalist from the Charleston Herald, Bill Breyer, went to a Hornwright site to investigate. It would be there that he would discover the motherlode. I've just made my way up to a small gap in the first line of fencing. The security here is intense. Barbed wire, armed guards. Feels like a war zone. I'm making my way over a small ridge and I... Mother of God! Ground shaking and... Oh my God. What is that? Hey, you! This is private property! Shit, it's that reporter. Jesus. He's got a gun! Gun? Wait, this isn't a- ah! Bill Breyer would be killed by Hornwright security. Publicly, Daniel Hornwright would claim the incident as an accident, but he was secretly glad that the reporter had died, as it meant that other journalists would think twice before coming to investigate. As the automation riots emerged and grew in severity across the region, the Motherlode project was finally reaching its end stage. Just as more and more human workers began to strike, the Motherlode was reaching peak efficiency. To Daniel and Hornwright Industrial, it didn't matter that they had no more human employees. The Motherlode mining robots made them obsolete anyway. Equipped with advanced AI and sensor systems, Hornwright Industrial could continue sucking the region dry of its natural resources. However, the aftermath of the Great War left the motherlode abandoned and forgotten. For decades, it would lay dormant in its subterranean lair, awaiting the return of human civilization and a chance to fulfill its intended purpose. But as the world succumbed to nuclear devastation and mutated creatures started to roam the land, the motherlode's fate seemed destined to remain an unanswered question. It was not until the arrival of the vault dwellers emerging from Vault 76 that the mysteries surrounding the motherlode began to unravel. As these adventurers began to explore the desolate Appalachian region, they stumbled upon hints and clues that pointed to the existence of a colossal mining robot lurking beneath the surface. Venturing into the abandoned Hornwright Industrial Headquarters, the vault dwellers would eventually discover the motherlode robot, broken and asking for a repair beacon. Upon finding and deploying the beacon, the motherlode thanks the vault dweller and notes that they'll be in contact in the future. Friendliest drill out there. But the story of the motherlode does not end there. With the Wastelanders update, rumors of an Appalachian treasure hidden within Vault 79 brought people back to the region. Determined to get into the vault, the Spruce Knob settlers would enlist the help of the Vault Dweller from 76 to find a way in. Good news, they already met the motherlode. The settlers and Vault Dweller would use the mega mining mech during the Vault 79 heist. As one of the largest robots in the Fallout universe, the Motherlode represents the dual nature of humanity's pursuit of progress. Its towering presence embodies the awe-inspiring feats of engineering and innovation, while also reminding us of the calamitous aftermath that unchecked ambition can bring. While impressive, the Motherlode would only ensure benefits for grubby corporations. In the desolate world of Fallout's America, the Motherlode serves as a haunting reminder of the delicate balance between advancement and its potential fallout. The Chimera Next is one that you might not have expected, but as the Fallout 3 Chimeras are affected by the robotics expert perk, I think it qualifies as a robot. And plus, I'm not really sure where a person would fit inside this thing if it wasn't a robot, you know? There's not a lot of space. Anyway, if you think it's not a robot, that's fine, just let me know. The Chimera battle tank, first seen in Fallout 3's Operation Anchorage DLC, 
is a formidable war machine used by the People's Liberation Army in the Anchorage simulation. But it wasn't always this mythical harbinger of death. Rather, when China's military took over Anchorage and its surrounding mining settlements, they modified some mining rigs and mounted laser cannons on top of them. Behold, the Chimera battle tank. Featuring heavy reinforced plating, drill-shaped treads, and a robust chassis, the Chimera is described by Lt. Thomas Morgan as being bigger and tougher than any of America's own tanks. The tank's primary armament consists of a mounted laser turret capable of firing devastating energy projectiles, striking fear into the US Army's forces. The virtual military simulation within Fallout 3's DLC allows players to experience the intense battles fought against the Chinese army during the liberation of Alaska. During the simulation, the Lone Wanderer encounters the Chimera battle tank as a sort of mini-boss at the Chimera fuel depot. Its size, firepower, and durability pose a formidable challenge that may require careful planning and strategic thinking. If you're like me, I just go bing bop zap pow and it's donezo, but I'm built different. The encounter with the Chimera battle tank highlights the lengths to which pre-war societies would go to secure their interests and assert dominance. The weaponization of what was once a civilian machine exemplifies the unchecked militarization and arms race that ultimately contributed to the Great War and the subsequent nuclear devastation. The Cargobot and Vertibot Two lesser known robots across the Fallout franchise are the Cargobot and Vertibot. Typically seen in tandem, the pair reinforce Appalachia's obsession with automation. The Cargobot, a massive unmanned aircraft, roams the skies of Appalachia, primed and ready to deliver government airdrops to those with a US government supply requisition code. Resembling a sort of large drone with claw arms, the Cargobot is quite the piece of mechanical engineering. Four adjustable booster engines allow the bot to navigate the air with ease. Three grabber arms allow for the transportation of even the heaviest of payloads, including sentry bots. And the center of where the four engines meet houses the flight control systems. Developed by the United States Armed Forces in 2060, the cargo bot was designed to perform reconnaissance and deliver supplies to places with hostile conditions. Its reinforced plated armor made it quite sturdy in the case of taking enemy fire. The National Catastrophe Relief Auxiliary set up an automated system that would dispatch fleets of cargo bots in the event of a national disaster. While the cargo bot itself is completely unarmed, a complementary robot would often be put on escort duty. The Vertibots are an automated variant of the classic Verta Bird. Initially designed for covert operations as part of something called Project Locust, the sheer size of the Vertibot rendered it unviable for stealth purposes. Instead, it would be deployed for combat support and security operations. While appearing as a simple vertibird, the vertibot features opaque windows and lacks a traditional cockpit. Heavy armaments, strong armor, and the lack of a human operator made the vertibot perfect for providing air support during even the most dangerous encounters. The United States Strategic Air Command, the part of the military responsible for its nuclear arsenal, employed fleets of cargo bots and vertibots as part of the Appalachian Automated Launch System protocols. Following the Great War, this fact would allow Thomas Eckhart's enclave access to the nuclear network. Thomas Eckhart managed to trick the automated system into believing that the region was under threat from a Chinese invasion. As protocol indicated, a lone cargo bot, escorted by three vertibots, would take to the skies in order to deliver nuclear keycards to government officials. Enclave troops and vault dwellers would intercept these convoys to use the keycard and take command of the three nuclear missile silos. The Cargobot and Vertibot are sort of polar opposites when it comes to pre-war innovation. The Cargobot, a completely pacifist robot, was a tech marvel designed to help people in tough and remote situations. And the Vertibot, a shining example of the pre-war military complex, was designed for high-risk offensive missions. One half of the technology spectrum was helpful and innovative, the other was destructive and derivative. If you think about it, this polarity of the two robots is quite similar to the polarity of nuclear technology itself. 
helpful on one end of the spectrum, destructive on the other. And what's a bit ironic is that when the Cargobot and Vertibot are paired together, they hold, quite literally, the key to nuclear destruction. I might be reading a bit much into it, but it's still a neat comparison. The Giant Scorpion Hidden away in the forbidden zone of the Big Empty Research and Development Center, a mechanical guardian awaits its next victim. The X-42 Giant Roboscorpion is the largest of the Roboscorpion variants. Armed with menacing claws and a deadly laser stinger, the giant Roboscorpion is a fearsome and awe-inspiring sight, combining advanced technology and impeccable engineering. The origins of the giant Roboscorpion can be traced back to the brilliant yet eccentric Dr. Mobius, a renowned scientist and member of the think tank at the Big Empty. Designed for security of the Big Empty, Mobius and his team built these robotic guardians in the X-42 Robo Warfare facility. Through a combination of salvage technologies, AI programming, and powerful energy weaponry, Mobius found success with his creations. The Roboscorpions could be built from random parts lying about, optical and audio systems allowed for remote takeover if necessary, and a tail-mounted energy blaster provided the necessary deterrence for any would-be trespassers. The result was the birth of the Roboscorpion, an example of Dr. Mobius' genius and antagonistic ways. Once the original Roboscorpion proved a success, the US military wanted their own, though this one would be much, much bigger. The X-42 giant Roboscorpion model would be entirely crafted from Saturnite, a unique polymer alloy developed at the Big Empty. Its tail-mounted weapon, rather than being a typical laser, would instead be a new prototype atomic laser. A notable effect from this was that the bot would leave behind residual radiation after discharging its weapon. The giant Roboscorpion would never reach a combat-ready state, and only one functional prototype is found post-war, sitting idle in the Robo Warfare facility, now dubbed the Forbidden Zone. At the climax of the Old World Blues DLC, the courier must deal with the X-42 giant Roboscorpion. This battle is equal parts memorable and challenging. Its imposing size and deadly attacks showcase the raw power and destructive capabilities of pre-war military technology. And while the giant Roboscorpion can be deactivated with the robotics expert perk, it will restart itself after a certain amount of time, a unique feature among all New Vegas robots. Defeating the Atominous Arachnid rewards the player with an upgrade to the Sonic Emitter. Beyond its formidable presence and combat prowess, the giant Roboscorpion serves as a reminder of the scientific achievements and ambitions of pre-war society. Developed in the advanced research facilities of the Big Empty, this mechanical monstrosity showcases the incredible technological feats that were once within humanity's grasp. It stands as a testament to the scientific genius an innovative spirit that characterized the pre-war world, while also highlighting the dangerous consequences of unbridled progress. Also be thankful that we didn't have to fight this giant Roboscorpion. Look at the legs on this sucker. Holy moly, it is absolutely huge. It might be the biggest robot in the franchise, actually. Liberty Prime Now perhaps the most iconic robot across the entire Fallout franchise, and probably one that you are waiting this whole video for, is the Kami Crusher Liberty Prime. In the hollowed grounds of the Capital Wasteland, where the remnants of Washington lie in ruins, an incomplete war machine waits idly for its inaugural activation. The lore surrounding Liberty Prime dates back to the pre-war era, where the United States was embroiled in a bitter struggle against China's communist forces. Constructed as a result of an unprecedented joint project between the US military, Robco Industries, and General Atomics International, Liberty Prime was designed to be the most powerful combat robot in the history of warfare. With the project initiated by General Konstantin Chase in 2072, Liberty Prime was supposed to be the very embodiment of American military might, a walking, talking, nuke-tossing hero who would remind the world what it means to be a superpower. Confident that the project would see completion in the coming years, Chase issued a press release about their work, stating that the United States Army is proud to announce that for the first time in history, General Atomics International, 
and Robco have joined forces to create this great country, a super weapon that will leave every single yellow-bellied red shaking in their commie booties. However, this celebration came much too early. While the chassis, voice module, and weapon systems were completed, the engineers were unable to develop a power source that was both strong and small enough to power all of Prime's systems. And by the time one of America's greatest minds, vault tech scientist Stanislaus Braun was contacted for help, he had already gone into seclusion, working on a secretive project for vault tech The Liberty Prime project wouldn't see any more breakthroughs pre-war. America was forced to press on in the Alaskan conflict sans Prime. Liberty Prime would sit in a bay below the Pentagon, gathering dust for nearly 200 years. In 2255, Owen Lyon's Brotherhood of Steel found the mechanical menace and set up shop. The steel would resume the development of Liberty Prime. However, the same power problem persisted. For 20 years, head scribe Reginald Rothschild would make marginal progress. Seemingly, every step forward was met with an equal step backwards. Redistributing power didn't work, developing a new power source nearly killed Elder Lyons, and energy management was terribly inefficient. The Brotherhood would find success in 2277 when Rivet City scientist Dr. Madison Lee showed up at the Citadel's doorsteps. The antagonist remnants of the pre-war US government, the Enclave, had hijacked her water purification project, forcing her and her team to seek shelter with the steel. Madison's prior work on fusion power applications provided exactly what Rothschild and his team needed. At the climax of Fallout 3, players witnessed the resurrection of Liberty Prime as the Brotherhood of Steel seek to deploy this formidable weapon against the Enclave in an effort to reclaim Project Purity. The presence of Liberty Prime is remarkable. As it stomps through the ruins of Washington DC, it exudes power and authority, its voice resonating with thunderous declarations of patriotism. The towering titan obliterates enemies with laser beams and bombs, leaving a trail of destruction in its wake. But while fighting alongside Liberty Prime can be an exciting moment for the player, it also raises thought-provoking questions about the nature of power, the consequences of blind loyalty, and the complexities of wartime ideologies. While Liberty Prime is presented as a symbol of American patriotism and the fight against communism, it exists as an ironic portrayal of the government's misplaced priorities in the face of a world-ending event. Facing a conflict that could wipe out all of humanity, the desperate desire to have a walking, talking nuke-tossing war machine only represents the absurdity of pre-war decision-making. While public unrest is at an all-time high leading into the late 2070s, rather than aiding its citizens, the government is pouring more and more resources into a gargantuan robot aimed at combating an ideology. This is only further emphasized through Prime's dialogue. Bombastic nationalism relentlessly pursuing the eradication of communism only reinforces the simplistic black and white worldview of the Sino-American War. Complex issues were reduced to, it's us versus them. So while Liberty Prime remains an iconic and colossal figure, it also serves as the ultimate reminder of unchecked power. And those are the biggest robots in Fallout. From the devastating firepower of the Sentrybot, to the overly patriotic Liberty Prime. The legacy of these mighty machines demonstrates that the true measure of progress lies not only in the magnitude of our achievements, but also in our ability to wield them responsibly. As always, thanks for listening. If you liked the video, be sure to share and subscribe. Have a good rest of your day. Cheers. User presence detected. Priority materials deposited in docking station. Motherload 003 complete, user. Motherload complete. Motherload remembers.